Even in so delicate a matter as the relation of the sexes, the anarchists do not shrink from the application of their principle. They acknowledge and defend the right of any man and woman, or any men and women, to love each other for as long or as short a time as they can, will or may. To them, legal marriage and legal divorce are equal absurdities. They look forward to a time when every individual, whether man or woman, shall be self-supporting and when each shall have an independent home of his or her own. Whether it be a separate house or rooms in a house with others, when the, when the love relations between these independent individuals shall be as varied as our individual inclinations and attractions, and when children born of these relations shall belong exclusively to the mothers until old enough to belong to themselves. Such are the main features of the anarchistic social ideal. There is a wide difference of opinion among those who hold it as to the best method of obtaining it. Time forbids the treatment of that phase of the subject here. I will simply call attention to the fact that it is in an ideal utterly inconsistent with that of those communists who falsely call themselves anarchists, while at the same time advocating a regime of anarchism fully as despotic as that of the state socialists themselves. And it is an ideal that can be as little advanced by Prince P Kropotkin as retarded by the brooms of those Miss Paddingtons of the bench who sentenced them to prison, an ideal which the martyrs of Chicago did far more to help by their glorious death upon the gallows for the common cause of socialism than by their unfortunate advocacy during their lives in the name of anarchism, of force as revolutionary agents and authority as a safeguard of the new social order. The anarchists believe in liberty, both as an ends and means, and are hostile to anything that antagonizes it. The Two Socialisms I should not undertake to summarize this altogether too summary exposition of socialism from the standpoint of anarchism, did I not find the task already accomplished for me by a br brilliant French journalist and historian, Ernest Lezine, in the form of a series of crisp antithesis, by reading which... To you as a conclusion of this lecture, I hope to deepen the impression which it has been endeavored to me. There are two socialisms. One is communistic, the other solidaritarian. One is dictatorial, the other libertarian. One is metaphysical, the other positive. One is dogmatic, the other scientific. One is emotional, the other reflective. One is destructive, the other constructive. Both are in pursuit of the greatest possible welfare for all. One aims to establish happiness for all, the other to enable to be happy in his own way. The first regards the state as a society so generous of any an especial essence, the product of a sort of divine right, outright of and above all society, with special rights and able to extract special obediency. The second considers the state as an association like any other, generally managed worse than others. The first proclaims the sovereignty of the state, the second recognizes no sort of sovereign. One wishes all monopolies to be held by the state, the other wishes the abolition of all monopolies. One wishes the governed class to become the governing class, the other wishes the disappearance of classes. Both declare that the existing state of things cannot last. The first considers revolutions as the indispensable agent of evolutions. The second teaches that repression alone turns evolutions into revolution. The first has faith in a cataclysm. The second knows that social progress will result from the free play of individual efforts. Both understand that we are entering upon a historic phase. One wishes that there should be none but proletariats. The other wishes that there should be none, no more proletariats. The first wishes to take everything away from everybody. The second wishes to leave each in possession of its own. The one wishes to expropriate everybody. The other wishes everybody to be a proprietor. The first says, do as the government wishes. The second says, do as you wish yourself. The former threatens with despotism. The latter promises liberty. The former makes the citizen the subject of the state. The latter makes the state the employee of the citizen. One proclaims that labor pains will be a necessity to the birth of a new world. The other declares that the real progress will not cause suffering to anyone. The first has confidence in social war. The other believes only in the works of peace. One aspires to command, to regulate, to legislate. The other wishes to attain the minimum of command, of regulation, of legislation. One would be followed by the most atrocious of reactions. The other opens unlimited horizons to progress. The first will fail, the other will succeed. Both desire equality. One by lowering heads that are too high, the other by raising heads that are too low. One seems equally under a common yoke. The other will secure equity, equality and complete liberty. One is intolerant, the other is tolerant. One frightens, the other reassures. 
The first wishes to re- instruct everybody. The second wishes to enable everybody to instruct himself. The first wishes to support everybody. The second wishes to enable everybody to support himself. One says, the land to the state, the mind to the state, the tool to the state, the product to the state. The other says, the land to the cultivator, the mind to the miner, the tool to the laborer, the product to the producer. There are only these two socialisms. One is in the infancy of socialism. The other is in its manhood. One is already the past. The other is the future. One will give place to the other. Today, each of us must choose for the one or the other of these two socialisms, or else confess that he is not a socialist. Benjamin R. Tucker, 1886